All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started since I became the PRP after 2018. So just a little bit of history about the group, and we thought it was a good opportunity to also show the value of patients in this process, no matter how early it is and how it may not even seem like, how, wow, how could a patient be involved in synovial tissue and <laughs> the pathology? So in 2018 at Omeract, I was not in the working group. I was the, I was in the audience, but what became really apparent was we have this really amazing synovial tissue biopsy where we're moving towards precision medicine and we need medicines to work early so that people like me and Deb and everyone else can have an opportunity to achieve remission and match people with the right treatment at the right time. So the science is amazing. It's science is necessary, but one of the things that came up in the last SIG was the non, some of the non-patients had had the biopsy performed on them and quote unquote, I was up and run and skiing in two days. So it seemed like, wow, this is amazing. It's pain-free. This is novel. Well, the problem was not all of the, the patient perspective and the patient who had the same biopsy had about a month recovery time. So it was a real eye-opener. And after that, they said, wow, the patient perspective is really important. And for that reason, they invited me at, right afterwards to me <laughs> and the SIG. And I said, well, I want to do this. I'm passionate about precision medicine, but this person, Deb, has RA and has had a biopsy. So she needs to be in the group as well. So that's a little bit of a history. Um, it has definitely been, um, since that happened, I met Orly and we've been talking about the synovial biopsies. And when I had mine done in Wisconsin, um, probably 15 to 20 years ago, um, it took me about three weeks to be whole again. And they didn't give me a steroid shot during the biopsy or after the biopsy. So again, when they were talking, and they're going to talk a little bit more about that, but what was really interesting to me is like, I'm like, well, that would have been novel because if they would have given me the steroid shot, I would have, wouldn't have have had the inflammation and um, I would have felt better almost immediately. So it makes it more tolerable um, from the patient's perspective. And again, I'd go back in for one if I was giving a steroid shot. So I just wanted to add one more thing after that. And then um, kind of leading into what the, what the presentation will be about was there was a question that evolved from that SIG and it was, would patients participate in a trial to get a biopsy if there's pain and issues involved? So that is very important to mention because that did derive out of that. So I wouldn't have signed back up for one if that was the case. <laughs> so thank you very much. So look, we'll, we'll, we'll divide this session into, into talks. So we have had uh, introductions in the PRP perspectives. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the synovial tissue and how we ended up to this point. And then orally imaging leader will present some really interesting findings about the study we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, and then the challenges in conducting that study. And uh, then we'll have a round of discussion. So for, for those of you who don't routinely do synovial biopsies are not very um, aware of this particular niche area of rheumatology, you know, the synovium is the lining of the joint and typically we do the biopsies from the knees, uh, but several of the joints are amenable to biopsies, including wrists, uh, MCPs, uh, and sometimes even the shoulder. Now this is the normal synovium. And interestingly, this is one of my patients after six months of treatment. So nice, flat, pink, smooth, no synovitis whatsoever. These are some of our pictures. You can see that the synovium has, a, a normal synovium has a lining, which is two or three layers thick, and a sublining, which has uh, 
very little in the way of inflammatory infiltrate in a normal setting. But that obviously changes in the context of inflammation. So in terms of uh, what can be done, synovial fluid obviously can be assessed. There can be macroscopic assessment of synovitis and people have worked on the pattern of blood vessels and whether that is predictive enough of what the diagnosis, which it isn't. And the synovial membrane biopsies, which has the field has grown exponentially in the last few years with uh, single cell sequencing and transcriptomics in particular. Lots of methods of doing synovial biopsies. So uh, it started on with this uh, Parker Pearson needle, uh, which was a blind needle biopsies, which is actually seems a slightly brutal technique, but it is actually not that bad. Arthroscopic biopsies and more recently ultrasound guided biopsies. So taking on that perspective, uh, Omarak doesn't work in the past shows that they are safe and well tolerated. And in contrast to Deb's unfortunate experience, my experience has been quite different. So I've been doing arthroscopies. This is a mini arthroscopy, not a large bow one, for almost 15 years now. And I haven't seen one flare yet. And the reason for that, I see every patient a week after my biopsy and call them the next day. And the reason for that is unless there is no synovitis whatsoever, I'll always give a steroid injection at the end because I do think it helps the uh, settle the local synovitis, prevents a flare of the synovium causing potential problems with leakage of the fluid and healing and so on. So uh, I find that uh, that should be part of a routine practice. Deb, did you have? Okay, perfect. So in this, as you can see, both the arthroscopies and the ultrasound guided needle biopsies were safe and well tolerated, although they weren't directly compared with each other. Subsequent to that, uh, there's been a lot of progress with OMERACT, and the next step was to validate a uh, minimally invasive ultrasound guided biopsy technique by the OMERACT filter. And it was found that the tissue that is obtained is actually quite compatible. And indeed, this was led by uh, Cospid Salas and Francis Humby from the London group and was subsequently published. We contributed our biopsies as well. So 159 procedures from five centers. All the biopsies yielded good tissue, which was degradable. These were consecutive biopsies. And all yielded RNA of significant quality and quantity for subsequent transcriptomic analysis. So we know that rheumatoid arthritis has lots of different uh, phenotypes. It's heterogeneous and uh, some people are aqua positive, some are negative, some people have B cell infiltrates, some are remarkably devoid of B cells in terms of the synovial tissue. And despite the fact that the synovial tissue is a main target organ, it is still not very, very clear despite all these years, what is the exact relationship between the pathology and the therapeutic response? apart from the fact that the technology has expanded exponentially. And we think that our SIG may complement other OMARAC groups. So the goals were to create a quality score for synovial tissue biopsy analysis uh, using the Delphi method or the Delphi method and complete a multicenter synovial biopsy tissue study to identify the relationship between pathology and the response to treatment. So this work, a lot of work done by Orally and uh, Doug Veal in this uh, to create recommendations. So we had, uh, there were multiple rounds of uh, questionnaires sent to people with an interest in the field uh, in a Delphi survey. And there were three rounds of iterative refinement with each round and anonymized details were then sent back to the participants. This was subsequently published as a consensus of the EULA uh, synovitis and the uh, OMARAC synovial tissue biopsy groups. Uh, the highlighting doesn't show up all that well, but essentially the criteria were for clinical practice and for translational research. So in clinical practice, a uh, minimum of four biopsies needed to be retrieved in small joints, uh, in different areas of the joints. A lining layer should be seen, a morphology of the synovial tissue should be preserved. There should be a semi-quantitative score and a synovial score and pathotype should be described. Very similar in translational research, but a minimal of six biopsies, and I'll come to why that is so. A lining layer, the one I showed with the two tooth cell layers, that's critical to identify that that's the right tissue and perhaps the sublining. Again, a synovitis score and analysis could be semi-quantitative or quantitative. 
So uh, our next step then was to define Sanerville histological markers of response to treatment by the OMARAC filter. And the reason we come to that, as I said, that despite the previous studies, which were rather small done in number of centers, we thought it's good to get all the centers together and have people do, uh, you know, analyze the biopsies so as to see whether they could predict uh, response to treatment, particularly as attempts to identify biomarkers from a blood sample have generally been inconsistent and we don't have uh, too many tests uh, which have been well established for that. Of course, annual biopsy is not routinely yet established as a standard of care or in RCTs, a choice of therapy or prognostication for a range of different reasons. I guess one of the main reasons is there's lack of access to expertise, or even if people collect the biopsies, then people are a bit unclear as to what do we do with it? What streams do they go in and how are they processed? But now with the ultrasound guided biopsy technique, things are a little bit better. And obviously in OMARAC 2018, we presented the results of the biopsy handling and the analysis. So these are some of our pictures uh, from arthroscopy and I hope you find them interesting. So this is a normal synovium, one of our patients with, uh, who treated for six months of treatment, effective treatment, nice flat synovium. This is a rheumatoid arthritis baseline. You can see the frondy synovial tissue with uh, typically straight blood vessels. Uh, it's quite congested, but not that much. In contrast to psoriatic arthritis, which is highly inflamed, tortuous blood vessels, typically quite friable, bleeds when you try to do a biopsy. And this, is, this lace-like structure that you see here is the so-called panis one, which one keeps on reading about in the literature that eats away at the uh, interface of the cartilage and the bone. So histology-wise, there are a range of differences. Uh, so we've talked about the normal. In rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the lining layer, so you can see that the lining layer is considerably thickened from two to three cell layers thick to sometimes multiple, even nine or 10 layers thick. There's a heavy infiltration of uh, inflammatory cells, which can be very different in pattern. So it can be more diffuse, so all the red or brown, if you like to call it. So that's the, those are the positive cells. So here you can see they're quite diffuse as opposed to nicely in a follicle here called let's say ectopic lymphoid follicle. And the staining can also be diverse. So that's staining the brown stuff with the TNF and that with, that's with the T cells. Subsequently, there have been more attempts to standardize this a little bit. Uh, a lot of this was led by the London group as well. So these are some of our pictures showing uh, follicular patterns. I said, so, so that's, that's the typical lymphoid uh, follicle, ectopic lymphoid follicle with CD45 RO for T cells, CD22 for B cells, and CD68 for macrophages, as opposed to a more diffuse type of infiltration here. Now, a landmark paper that was published at around this time in 2014-2015 did transcriptomics on uh, those four types of samples. And it was found that there are four different types, so low inflammatory, myeloid, fibroid, and lymphoid, which roughly correlate with those histologic patterns that one sees. Now, why is it important assessing biopsy fragments or the right biopsy fragment? Now, this is a patient I did an arthroscopy on not so long ago, maybe several weeks ago. Interestingly, the patient had no knee symptoms whatsoever. We did it as a part of our study. Zero symptoms, I go in like fluorid synovitis inside, which is not the first time I've seen it. So these biopsies were collected at the same time, processed at the same time. There are different fragments within the joint, same preparation, same, the same slide. And you can see the vast differences in that first picture on the very left. You can see that there are a, a number of ectopic lymphoid follicles there, highly inflammatory, but very clear lining and sublining. So you'd say, okay, this is a lymphoid type of infiltrate. That middle picture, there's only that little bit of lining. Now we would normally deem even this lining enough to uh, assess our biopsies. Uh, there's a good sublining, but there's not much infiltrate. And we would say, well, maybe this is diffuse myeloid or lymphoid. Whereas here you can see that there's a bit of cartilage, no adipose tissue, lots of cellular infiltrate, but there are no clear follicles. So you can see that within the same joint, the variability can be immense. So having a good biopsy is critical. And I'll also you know, emphasize that these were done by arthroscopy where there's a lot of uh, freedom, shall we say, to pick up whatever area of the joint you want to do because you're actually inside the joint. 
moving back to moving back to the heterogeneity of inflammation. So on the left side is is are the four is a single biopsy from a single patient stained at the same time for T cells on the left top, TNF, CD22 for B cells and IL6. And as you can see, this one patient had lots of T cells. This is a baseline biopsy, but no TNF, very few B cells and no IL6. In contrast to another patient on the right-hand side where the red cells are positive one, lots of TNF, hardly any T cells. So we know that uh, not only is the inflammatory infiltrate heterogeneous at the HNE level, but even when you stain it, the cellular composite is very different. One of the issues has been that although there are a handful of centers, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, and methodological heterogeneity across centers. We thought that prior to addressing some of the newer techniques, uh, we need to standardize immunohistochemistry chemistry across the centers. Why did we settle on SQ as a semi-quantitative analysis? Because that's the easiest one to do. So you look at the slides, quantify the infiltrate, and potentially translate it easily from the bedside to the bench and back to the bedside. So our issues prior to doing that were to obviously ensure uniformity of biopsy handling and analysis and creation of a quality score and facilitate identification of the immunistic chemistry and histology. So the aims of the SIG in the previous OMER Act, following on from a Delphi survey, was to assess whether histologic analysis can guide choice of the most appropriate treatment, predict response to treatment, and then also to create an atlas and define a consistent set of histological items to be used further for prediction of treatment response. So I'll now hand over to our emerging lead orally to uh, carry on. Right. I guess while we're trying to fix this, uh, is it fine? It... All right. Thank you. So um, before I start, I wanted to ask if anyone knew what this is. This is not a rainbow. I saw that yesterday in the sky as I was working outside. No one? Right. I'm not going to tell you and <laughs> until the end to keep you. Okay, right. Okay, so I think um, that uh, going forward, I'm just going to take you back in history. And um, the point here is really to remind everyone of what has been done. And in fact, the Sinovial Tissue Seek started in 2004 with this team of people. Um, and uh, the, the whole uh, process behind that was actually to define synovial tissue as a core outcome set, especially the infiltrate. And the reason behind this was this um, actually published in 2008 as part of Omeract um, as well, defining that this staining here, which stains for uh, its CD68, so it stains for tissue macrophages, was actually a biomarker of response to treatment that could be used in clinical trials. So you wanna try a new drug, right? Instead of giving it to hundreds of people and assess clinical response at three to six months, you're gonna take a biopsy, treat people, look at the biopsy again, and if the cell infiltrate has not reduced, it's very unlikely that this drug is going to do something clinically. And this is how this has been all set up. Um, and so it's great that we have a core outcome set, but then we need to measure this, right? And this is how a lot of different parameters need to be taken into account. And the first one is, as me here um, very well said earlier, the technique. And although this has been validated that, you know, techniques are pretty much similar when it comes to tissue outcome, um, this is definitely something that can bring some heterogeneity in the process. But also, oh, I have a few videos here. Um, you can probably imagine that when you take a biopsy with arthroscopy and you see the inside of the joint really well, you're going to go to to spots where you get the most inflammation. And in fact, it's been demonstrated that in many people, um, the inflammation is fairly patchy. So you're going to go where the inflammation is and where you can see it. Now, if you do the same thing with ultrasound, you cannot really define if it's patch inflammation that and make sure you're going to take the tissue where it's the most inflamed. That's here 
a video of um, synovial biopsy with the needle here. Um, and then when you trigger that needle, uh, it's gonna capture some tissue in that notch here, right? Um, so although they both bring tissue of good enough quality for analysis, they might bring different pieces of tissue. And in fact, and, and again, I think it was very nicely shown in me here slides with the different pieces of tissue within one single patient, um, depending on whether you take your biopsy here, here or there, you might have different findings. And this is what we call intraarticular variability. Um, and so obviously therefore there was a massive need for standardization. And ever since 2008, there's been a lot of publication trying to achieve that, whether it's from standardizing the type of patients you want to include for specific research questions, whether it is the way you sample tissue, whether it is the way you handle the tissue, whether it is the way you analyze the tissue. And this is what we tried to achieve in 2018 with the recommendation, but also, um, yeah, these are the, 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 existing, um, inflama the existing scores to measure inflammation histologically was published at last. Um, and this is uh, the way we analyze tissue. There's three different ways to do that, especially for immunohistochemistry. The first one is you take your slide, you go under the microscope, and you spend hours having a very hard time counting each and every cell that you can see on the slide. And this is called quantitative, and this is a pain. I've done it, it it's, it's difficult, right? Or you can do semi-quantitative analysis. It's faster. You have an atlas as the one that I just showed, and you say, right, this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, um, according on, you know, it's a slight infiltrate, it's a moderate infiltrate, it's a, it's a large infiltrate. Um, and it's suitable for large numbers of samples, but it's not extremely accurate. Or you can do computerized digital image analysis, which is obviously an automatic system that analyzes the cells throughout the whole slide. I want to uh, tell you that none of these have been developed for computer. This is basically microscope based. Um, and, 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 and obviously we don't really, a lot of people now have moved onto the software and, 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 and computers. So none of these have been developed for that, right? But back in the days, there was this study that's from six centers, took 12 different slides, stained for, with the same staining, sent across different centers to analyze whether or not um, there was a good inter-observer agreement across different techniques. Um, and the results were pretty reassuring, as you can see here, for quantitative, semi-quantitative or digital analysis, the agreement was roughly 0.8, which it's not bad. Um, this being said, um, despite that we wanted to go further. And this is how we came up with this standardization process um, that me here uh, presented. So I'm not gonna go into details. Now, if we manage to standardize sampling, handling and analysis, when it comes to reporting, there was a massive heterogeneity. In fact, this is pretty much what we're doing and it's not great. This is an example from colleagues from Dublin of reports from histology of pieces of tissue that's been taken from clinical purposes, sent to the pathology department saying, hey, can you see something that is evocative of infection of you know, rheumatoid? And these are the reports. None of them are coming as a similar report. And I suspect that because of that, none of them have been really helpful. And, and therefore we needed to standardize also the way we report results. And in fact, when we did that project and, 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 and Mada, you were involved heavily in this, um, we wanted to do it for both clinical practice and research. But in fact, when we went into literature, we were unable to find any publication allowing any form of standardization for, in the literature review for clinical. And this ended up being a research uh, project. 
Now, when it comes to our aims, I think Mihir defined them already. Uh, we wanted to know how these standardization efforts uh, we've been doing throughout the years impacted the field. We wanted to know if we could establish inter-observer variability for histology and the context of computer-based analysis. Um, we wanted also to understand the possibility of predicting response to treatment solely based on histology. Um, and the way we've done that, we've asked uh, centers across the Sinival Tissue Expertise Network to submit slides and stain them for a few different staining, CD3, CD20, uh, uh, CD68, and uh, vascularity factor 8. Uh, upload them on the Keratritis server, which is a great server, and I'm not saying this just because Walter is in the room. <laughs> um, and um, we ask every center to score the slides with double observer and um, leading us to present the results today at the meeting. So we asked for slides from tissue taken in people with early rheumatoid arthritis, naive, to any biologic or targeted synthetic DMARDs for whom we knew the response at three and six months so that we can say whether or not we are able to predict the response based on um, the tissue. And then we ask people to digitalize the images so they can be shared on the platform. Um, and then we ask people to double score um, and also to provide so semi-quantitative scoring for each and every staining, but also provide a liker skirt of likelihood of response to each mechanism of action based on the tissue. And we put just four mechanism of actions here. Um, so this is the atlas we used for the CREN score, which is the H and E basic inflama inflammation score. And this is the atlas we put together as part of this project for all of the four um, immunohistochemistry marks and uh, zero to four, depending on the intensity of the infiltrate or the intensity of the vascularity, as you can see at the top. We got seven centers involved, 11 experts, basic experts, demographic, 27% women, not great. 91% clinician scientists. Uh, these are our patients, 36. So slides of biopsy from 36 patients have been um, uh, put together for this project. These are the patient's demographic. Um, so roughly um, classic array demographic, really. The biologic, mainly TNF, which is you know, kind of expected because this is usually the first biologic people go to and these people are naive. And then the response good in, in, in most cases. Um, this is the platform. And so what is great about this platform is it when you upload the slides, then you can see them. And if they've been scanned through a nano zoomer, for example, you can see the entirety of the slide going to see, for example, this piece. It's small here, but it has four different fragments. And so you were able to just move from a fragment to the other. So you can see the entirety of the tissue and this for every single staining. And this was the case for every single patient. Um, and then we were asked people to score on the platform directly with all the different marks. And we asked for also the presence or absence of lymphoid aggregates the pathotype that you know made me here showed earlier, um, and the CREN score, um, and also the Likert here. So is a patient likely and likely to respond to this or this mechanism of action? Uh, and so these are our results. So here we have every single user, and this is how good they uh, they're scoring correlated with each other. Um, so the bigger and the bluer the cycle, the higher the correlation is. So you can see when it comes to semi-quantitative score, it's actually not bad. Um, for those who want the numbers, they are here. And so roughly, we're around 0.7 um, across. Uh, and this is for um, all semi-quantitative scores all together. 
I don't have time to present uh, each and every of the scoring uh, parameter, but these were roughly along those lines. Now we're looking at the Likert scale for likelihood of response to treatment. It's way more heterogeneous. And in fact, there's one user here, user number three, that seems to go completely opposite way than the rest of the cohort, which is quite interesting. Um, and I'm not gonna try and single out anyone here, but there's something really interesting about this is that that person was the only one that wasn't a clinician, which is quite interesting if you think of it, right? Because it means that somehow when you try to modelize the gut feeling of the clinician, you have to have some form of experience in doing it to, 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 to maybe go with, with the rest of the group. But this being said, even across the, the, the other users, it was, it was quite heterogeneous as how they correlated one with each other. Um, this is another way of looking at the results, right? What is kind of interesting here is that all of the correlation between um, the users was quite good for semi quantitative scores. It seems that some people keep on scoring really low. Like if you see the green user, they just score everything low. And then if you look at the blue user, they score everything high. And so there's a big disparity as in, and this is not for one domain, this is for all of the different scoring domains. So it's quite interesting. Um, so this is the exact, yes. So we, we didn't have this kind of sitting all together and score a few slides together. However, this is the reason why we uh, provided an atlas. This is the reason why we put an atlas together to make sure that everyone was on the same page as for what is what. The atlas is just when you have uh, some doubts, but the training session on how to define the aspects, what they expect, it is very important. But this first attempt in uh, which they, uh, on how they do in their own practice, I would say, it is giving you the information on uh, which aspect you have to improve. So for example, it is uh, the total, the total CREN in uh, general, mm -hmm. or oh, one of the problems, there were no lymphoid aggregates, what I see there, <laughs> from no one. But I think that uh, it is actually quite nice. And how was the intra-observer reliability of them? Because this is even more interesting. Uh, if they correlate with themselves, if they are in agreement with themselves each time that they reread, and you will see by this how they know the capability to detect the, the findings. Yeah, no, that's that's a very interesting point. Uh, we we indeed this is indeed something you know we need to consider having having a sitting around and and you know having a like scoring session all together. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, when uh, you are uh, performing and taking, but uh, I think that is uh, quite good. So we found in a lot of our large scale animal studies like this, since you've already got digitized slides, we have found that we can eliminate some of the wild variation in things by having training sets that are completely separate and time separated okay. from the data set that is going into the actual trial that gets rescored. So we've done trainings with complete digitized slides, mm -hmm. waited a certain number of months, and then turned our 
group loose and had them do their scoring and then rescoring. And the time between those rescorings impacts the results as well. So for some reason, and I don't know how it is with, with clinician scientists, but the entire group that I usually work with is pathologists. Pathologists, if they have the whole slide to look at, to get in their own minds, because everybody reads a little bit different, even if you're looking at the exact same thing, the whole slide makes a difference as opposed to just yeah. a static image. Yeah. So and I, I think that that part of it could be helpful, but but the there is something to be said for training sessions. Mm-hmm. People worry about bias, biasing, right? And sort of hive minding the whole group. We haven't found that that happens. The The whole digitized slide makes a big difference though. And in fact, um, I think that reiterates a point in Manda's manuscript when she's referring to um, lessons learned from imaging about the application of the filter. And I think having validated knowledge transfer tools is an important part of the um, uh, sort of operability of what you do subsequently, Mm -hmm. right? So if you want to train other readers to score the same way that you evaluate your slides, you've got to have validated calibration tools that have been shown to perform. Yeah. 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 Um, that is helping you to see everything, you will have a very poor yeah. agreement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, that's that that's very helpful. That's very helpful indeed. Um and, and I'll come back to um the entirety of the slide versus pictures because that's something we had to kind of we, we came across actually, and this is probably one of the limitation of this work as well, but, um, right. So, um, I guess, I guess this is kind of fits well within what's just been said because, so now what's been done is, so some users, um, were alone in their center. They didn't manage to get someone else to score with them, but some, uh, obviously work together and they've been like pulled by color. And what's quite interesting is to see that, I mean, this is not that obvious for this one, but there still are some kind of disparities across centers and across experts that actually do work together, uh, which also see, seems to say that either we need to train everyone together, but also they need to get trained together within their own center as well, you know? Um, and, and, and moving on uh, from that, uh, these are the results of the Likert scale for likelihood of response to treatment. And I really like this slide because it really shows that, you know, some people seem to be very optimistic, right? These people in blue, they say, oh, people are going to respond to everything, but uh, rituximab, right? And then this person in purple here, nobody's going to respond to nothing, right? <laughs> Which, you know, it's quite interesting if you think of it. Um, and some people seem to be skewed towards one drug or the other, which is also interesting. But now this is um, the people within the same center pulled together. So these people in purple, the very optimistic one and the very pessimistic one, they work together. Um, and, you know, it's likely that when it did, they did the scoring, they didn't necessarily talk to each other either, which is, you know, quite interesting. But down the line, there is a big disparity as per what one physician thinks the response would be based on the tissue. Seven and uh, you or nine and the user six or uh, I don't know the blue, they, they are quite very well in agreement. Yeah. yeah. They are good. Yeah, yeah. So some they are, are coming from two centers. Yeah, 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 as well. And they are trying. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, we're moving to the last uh, section of these results. Um, it looks like abstract art, really. Like when I got these from my statistician, I thought, okay, I have no clue what this means. but. What's really interesting with this is, so I'm gonna show you the next slide because I think it's better. So that's the response at three months. 
That's people that responded well, people that responded moderately, people that didn't respond. And that's the Likert scale. And these are the different treatments. So what you want really is a cluster here showing that you know those who responded well, there was a prediction that they were gonna respond well, but there's none of that cluster happening. This basically means that we have no clue. <laughs> um, so, and this is the exact same at Mon 6. I mean, there seems to be a bit better of a clustering here, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think this it's is It's getting great. a little better. It is, it is, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, I mean, I guess this tells us that we need more work to kind of, yes. Can we can we finish and then we'll have a discussion? Thanks. Um, so yeah, so I guess I guess there were a few things that obviously along the, the way and the process made it a bit difficult. Um, so obviously we mentioned intraticular variability earlier. And 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 in fact, um some of the 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 user they provided entire fragments so everything could be looked at, and so you can kind of get over that variability, but some centers provided pictures of a bit of a slide. And so, you know, when you get to the 40 magnification and you just have one vessel, how do you assess vascularity, right? And this is, so this is something that obviously made it a bit difficult uh, and that can explain some of the, some of the results. Uh, the staining methods, we provided a staining protocol but we ended up with very different stainings, which also I think makes it a bit more difficult. We, when we put the document together as per how people should score, we went back to literature and we were really shocked to see that some of the semi-quantitative score, it's circular referencing to previous paper, to previous paper, to no paper. So you, you basically go back to the first paper and there's still a nut is the, 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 how it's been developed. So it's a bit of a problem as well. Then some people use a 023, some people use a 024. Um, then also, how do you translate the high power field you look on the microscope to the computer screen? You know, and it, this is different. Um, obviously, the pathotypes, when we started the project in 2018, it had progressed by the time we asked people to score. Um, how do you modelize the clinician gut feeling of what the response will be? Um, also, the groups were not necessarily extremely well balanced with a, more people with good response, more people with TNF, but um, it is what it is. Um, scanning splice system, I talked about it, double scarring, and time to complete because these takes time. Um, so I guess this is pretty much um, me done with presenting the results. Um, and before we open it for the discussion, there might be some uh, some some question or some some things to to, to discuss. Yeah. We are opening it for discussion. Okay. Yes. So. 9.30, right? 90 minutes. So we got half an hour. Okay. Just, uh, just, <laughs> just to, um, to say, I think that uh, for the, um, the problem of uh, the prediction of response, all the, the aspect on how to score and uh, which are the, the aspect, I think that it, it was very well uh, summarized. So you have uh, seen all the possible aspect of variability that should be taken into account and minimize if you want to have a good, um, I would say, a good reliability across centers. And uh, so you have to work on the scoring system, you have to work on the quality of the tissue and whatever, and also to the capability to see in the screen what you can see in the microscope and the training and the atlas. I think that one of the problem when you go to the prediction is the fact that uh, you do not know if you, what you have chosen can really predict response to TNF or other, because as you know, with the single cell, the transcriptomic, the expression of the genes, you know each year much more in detail which drug will work and which not. So 
I would not be so stressed about this aspect because probably what you have chosen as endpoint is not the right one or not completely. But at least that if you go that everyone is going on one direction, when there is this aspect that is telling you could respond to TNF, even if it doesn't respond, this is not a problem. But people are going in the same direction. It is this what it is important. And when you will find the right endpoint, you will have these uh, good correlations. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I'll, I'll give you the microphone in one second. I just want to comment on that because um, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and, 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 and there's something that I think kind of still worries me, though, is that the tissue that we see in the microscope and, you know, despite everything that we've done and published about standardizing, you seeing that, you know, it's still difficult to do. I think it did, that, that tissue is also the tissue that is used for single cell. And, you know, despite the fact that, you know, obviously it doesn't matter that much that there is a lining layer and the morphology, but still, because, you know, it, exactly. So if you take so if you look back to me, here's picture, if one of the fragments with a lot of fat is the one that is used and not the one with the, with the lymphoid, or the, you're going to have different results. So that worries me a bit, you know? I agree with you, but this is another problem, I would say. So it is another aspect of the variability of this kind of technique like we are doing with ultrasound. So is the acquisition. So I think that you have to work in parallel also on the standardization of the acquisition of the tissue. So uh, with all the studies uh, that uh, all the groups are performing, you have to decide how many samples, where they have should be taken the sample, which kind of ultrasound images you want to take. Because uh, as you know, in my division, we perform ultrasound synovial biopsy with Stefano and Marco. We have 10 synovial biopsy per day. So it means that we are taking synovial biopsy of everything. And may I tell you that even when you do this, I can see if I enter in the room that for me, what it is taken is not really the inflammatory one. So I would say, then they say me, yes, but I'm working on remission, it's fine. So in that case, I completely agree. But uh, if my top level expert and me, top level expert of ultrasound can disagree on what we have to, to take, can you imagine delay? people taking biopsy. So I think that you have to work on that. Where you take the tissue, how you take the tissue, and then the handling. It was what we found in the Euler project, so. So look, all, all uh, I may just interrupt there for a second. So all really excellent comments. Uh, I guess some of the literature that has been published since uh, that study and one a bit before that study is that there appear to be certain patterns which predict response to certain treatments, for example, yeah. Uh, you know, more of a myeloid pattern supposedly are sub response better to TNF versus a more lymphoid pattern and so on. But I do think that uh, at the variability between the biopsies in itself is a problem also at a level of predicting response, because if you don't see the right pathotype, you might argue that it's not going to respond, but in reality, that pathotype is present in a different fragment, which hasn't been seen. So taking those comments on board. Uh, quite a bit of work has been done on where the fragments should be taken from uh, and how many fragments. Some of them comes from the older literature. One of his limitation in uh, ultrasound guided biopsies, particularly when taken with a needle, is that there is one portal which you've entered into, and with a needle, there is only so much you can biopsy, even if you move the needle to either side. There's a bit more freedom with portal and forceps and probably even more freedom with arthroscopy, and that's, that's just the way it is. You know, nobody can change that. I guess we've got to take that into account as well. So, so one, one, uh, one point I, we haven't put there, but I might just put going forward is what I'm hearing. Would it be reasonable then to perhaps provide a set of slides and after a period of time, remove all the score and get people to rescore after a set of training slides and then see how things change and whether things change so that that will make obviously the study more robust. what we have done because synovial tissue biopsy is very much closer to the ultrasound standardization. If you use uh, the stepwise approach that we have uh, developed for ultrasound, so when uh, you go 
on what you define, also the definition <laughs> of inflammation, also to teach your, uh, I would say, histologist, uh, pathologist to make it, how to, um, how to improve the, the reliability when you have some problems or images, discussion, Delphi or whatever. This part will take some things, but if you do it in a standardized way, it will be very fast. And if you have this backbone really hard taken, so very good, this, it will be done in uh, one year. Once yeah. you have standardized all what you have at the beginning. That's, this will be very fast because then you have you agreeing, you have you having the right atlas, you have this that it is, um, how do you say, what the, the care uh, software, and then you can make, you will standardize with this, you can make the, the software, the artificial intelligence of this, it will be go fast. For the prediction, who cares? You are, we are working a lot on omics. In one year, two years, you will have also the response. The problem for me is not the single cell, because for me, it's the position also where it is that also probably predict a different response where you have this inflammation in the synovial tissue, you know. So, can you elaborate on that a little bit, Marta? So, when you say very if tissue, you have some cells in the lining or the sublining, you will have a different, uh, I would say, activity, response, or whatever. Yeah, probably the subsets would matter there. But, you know, uh, uh, getting the histopathologist to be involved is very difficult. Sorry, sorry, Walter. Um, I um, sort of missed something with um, the discussion in regards to linking the what you see on the histopathological slide with treatment response. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that influence treatment response. And that, to me, conceptually, is a multivariate analysis. And I didn't see how you did that. So to me, it looks like you did a univariate analysis of some sort, but there's a lot, awful lot of other factors that are gonna influence treatment response. So it ought to be a multivariate analysis. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that step. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Uh, we are looking at 36 samples, 36, Pa samples taken for 36 patients. We were not going to do a very fancy statistical analysis here. We were just trying to modelize. We we're not. We we're not saying okay. We're doing this study where we're going to predict how people re respond. I think we were more trying here to say okay, how does that look? If you ask very simply to a clinician, what do you think the response is going to be? And this is all we did. We we're not there to do a multivariate analysis and this is a different project and it would be really interesting but this was not the point of what we were trying to do here we were more trying to modelize the, the clinician gut feeling of you know and 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 then you know we're showing that actually we can't really predict anything but which is what we know but there is a way you can address that right so with your study design so it's one thing if, for example, you're taking all comers and biodemard naive and biodemard inadequate responders and so on, but you could have, for example, at least take those patients who perhaps are just taking standard DMARD therapies. In other words, you can focus on a specific patient subset that, um, you know, perhaps people are about to start a DMARD therapy very early in their disease course. If I was to think in what patient category this might work, this would be in a patient with a very early disease onset, patients who have not been exposed to DMARDs or steroids. That's where I'd be particularly interested to see whether this is predictive, right at, before you've even started the patient, any kind of treatment, right? So I think patient selection here, you may be shooting yourself in the foot by just sort of taking all comers to your study. So yeah, so I I I I I agree with you. Um, we took patients that were on conventional synthetic DMARDs that did not start any biologic. They were all biologic or targeted synthetic DMARDs naive, and they were all within the first year after diagnosis. These patients, you know, you 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 can get. It's, it's not that easy to biopsy them, depending on, you know, the setting of your, your, your biopsy program. Uh, now, getting people that are very, very early in the course of their disease, 
which is, you know, if, if you talk about those before even conventional synthetic DMARs, they're the holy grail. You know, you, you want to biopsy these people, but you just can't because it's just very difficult. I mean, some programs can, and, but if we were to try and get a, a set of slides that we can work on, we had to be a bit more inclusive. And this is why we went for those, you know, biologic and targeted synthetic DMARs. So what they want to know how to to be sure that once they have standardized, they are reliable, their gut feeling will really predict something, I guess. So just on that. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, there, there's, sorry. That's a really good question. So I'm 42 years into my journey. So, um, and it happened probably halfway in my journey that I had the synovial biopsy um, for a very specific reason. And um, it, it, we talked about that because I said, this, this project so is not me um, because I, I mean, I've been exposed to every biologic. So I can only imagine what my tissue would look like. Um, and just, I've bet on them all and I'm on my second trial through on some of the biologics as well. So, um, but being that early, um, I, I would, again, I'm science-minded. So anything for research, if, if that is something that's going to be helpful in my journey and predicting, uh, precision medicine is, is the holy grail, like you called it. I, I, it's a whole nother level. If I would, you're not wasting your time starting with a TNF if you're not even going to respond to it. And multiple TMS, I mean, all those different pieces as far as that goes. So, um, yeah, it, but it's also very different. There's also people who they don't even want to start any medications. And with even the rheumatologist recommending that, they don't know what they're walking into. You can lose joints um, from waiting, early, di early diagnosis, early detection, early treatment. That's the holy grail. <laughs> Thank you. Very helpful. Um, I, I'm aware you are all... <laughs> Uh, you know these studies from Constantino Pizzalis in, in Britain. And I think what came out was for me relatively frustrating in concern of uh, synovial biopsies and histology and immunohistochemistry. The prediction was poor. But if they did uh, expression profiling, uh, this is the study by Miles published in Nature Medicine, then uh, it was far more predictive for treatment response. And I think, and uh, maybe it's, you know, because of the cytokine milieu is different, even if you do not get the right patch, inflammatory patch, but still you may, if you have a myelin type, you may have other cytokines present and uh, other transcription uh, patterns. And this you can far more, re or probably it looks like this is, way more predictive for treatment response. And uh, therefore, I think immunohistology and pathology is perhaps not the right way to go further, rather to go for transcription profile. No, not probably need that, but we need that for being sure that we are taking synovial tissue because the synovial tissue is still retrieved by the clinicians and you have to go so, and it is important. So I think both, I take both of those comments on board. Uh, one of the things with Costa's study was, it was such, such it's a beautiful study, but uh, I'll remind people that it compared two drugs that were both active against B cells. So one could argue that we're comparing treatments that are broadly, well, lymphocyte active. So they excluded the TNF pathway in some ways. 
So perhaps that's why they didn't see that much of a response, but I do absolutely take on board that the newer sequencing methods will supersede this. But if you take that a step further, what's really going to come now is the spatial transcriptomics, and one cannot interpret that without a good knowledge of immunistic chemistry, which brings us back to standardization of immunistic chemistry. Because no matter how good the spatial techniques are, which we've been involved in in the last few months, you still need the background, good quality tissue to be able to select a region of interest uh, to be able to interpret the spatial. So I think uh, it will eventually come full circle where we standardize in a way that the whole thing can be put together. Um. Just for the record, the pathologist in the room is not at all insulted because I was what I was going to say was the exact same thing. A lot of us, especially those of us that have gotten elbow deep in running a court facility, um, your your whole presentation was like me looking at pieces of my career that I'm working on right now because pathologists who are skilled in validation of tissue collection, processing, and immunohistochemistry methods are all getting involved in the spatial transcriptomics genomics, because I do think that that is a large wave of the way that this is going to work out, because we're finding that it's more predictive for all kinds of things. But your foundation has to be the tissue is collected properly. It's fixed properly. What are you embedding in it? Who's cutting it? How is it going on the slide? Because this makes a huge difference. And then your immunohistochemistry protocol, as you were describing that, I was like, oh, I've lived this so many times. The problem is immunohistochemistry is as much an art as it is a science, regardless of how well your protocol is written. So you could have the most beautiful protocol in the world with every single step and every single volume, protein concentrations, yada, 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 all written out. You send it to another facility. They have the exact same auto stainer that you used in the place that you validate it, and it does not work. Controlling that is so incredibly difficult. So one of the things that we find somebody who is very good at validating these protocols and let them start to figure out how do we manage the difference in facilities and people handling it. Because even I have found in my own facility, I have a technician, everything works. I have another technician, about 50% of it works. Same facility, same room, same auto stainer, two different human beings. Yeah, it's know. it's like, I mean, we, we joke all the time. It's like voodoo, yeah. right? So, I mean, it really is. And my one amused to him is my one technician. I was telling him like, you're a wizard. I don't know how you do this, but it just works. But the other thing that I'm curious about, because you were, you were talking early about um, nano zoomer versus microscope versus these things. The other, the other part of what I do, which is an equally large problem is what platform of whole slide scanner are you using? And NanoZoom at this point is one of the most widely available, but it's incredibly out of date. <laughs> That's part of the problem. So one of the ways that we are getting around this is finding centers that have a more up-to-date scanner that is being actively used in human path clinical practices where there is an individual with expertise who is validating for diagnostic use whole slide scans, whether it's just h &E or immunohistochemistry. And we're having folks, because in the grand scheme of things, if you get your, like, make your slide at all these different facilities down, it's not such a huge added expense, especially in a study of this size, to ship all the slides to the exact same scanning facility to get it done. And then you standardize that piece of it and eliminate the problem. So if you find somebody that's got a brand new depends on which platform you're going for, but Philips makes some incredibly high resolution scanners that most pathologists rate as being as good as a glass slide or Leica makes a few of them. Um, Olympus has one platform that's incredibly great for immunohistochemistry that's also immunofluorescence based. So there, there are specific manufacturers of scanners that pathologists almost exclusively rate as being a better platform for doing this kind of thing. And then if you upload them into this glorious software, which works great by the way, um, then you eliminate that piece of your problem. Yeah. But the immunohistochemistry thing, like you, you, you have my, my sympathy and my, um, I, it pains because I know that it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah, no, th thank you for that comment. I think, I think we basically started with the idea that people were going to send us the actual slides. Yeah. So they were going to be scanned and then uploaded, but this didn't work. 
it, it didn't work, you know. This is a whole other ball of wax, but one of the other ways that we have gotten around this is, th is that in the, the smaller volume validation, this is how we're going to do this. Sometimes you have to get them to send you the tissue. I think one of one of the issues also is that, uh, remember, the study was done with no funding. Right. <laughs> this is like zero funding. So it is all on personal connections. Yeah. People having their yep. biopsies and look contacting centers. So. Had it not been for uh, personal connections, yep. uh, particularly yep. orally, yep. you know, we would not be here. Yeah. Because getting people to share their slides and it's it's really, really difficult. Yes. The other thing I would say is don't don't be, I, I'm going to echo what she said, don't be discouraged in the least. I look at these sorts of analyses all the time. This one is honestly quite good. It's honestly quite good. I have seen I have seen spider spider graphs where you're like, oh, oh, nope, <laughs> nope, that didn't work at all. This one, I was like, oh, that looks pretty good. <laughs> so don't be discouraged at all. I, th I think you're getting there. I, I, I is completely, uh, completely agreement. You have a lot of good starting points that uh, you will not take so much time for standardized if you follow a standardized path on the histology and on the acquisitions so so i guess then we've got to move on to what we think are the, the next uh, next steps to uh, move this forward so as i said i'm thinking the next step might be to standardize it a period of time and if we can have walter generous help with this server again <laughs> then redo the scoring after a period of time as elapsed between the people don't remember about their score. You know, obviously that memory is gone. Uh, and then and then see how our results change. How willing would the people, sorry. How willing would um, your friends be in sending you the slides? Like, so you can, in versus pictures, how willing would they be? Because it like what Kara was saying, it sounded, I mean, really beneficial as far as having the same person interpreting. But I think that uh, in that case, um, it is, this could be for the future. Yeah. They have that yeah. and it is nice to agree on what they have because this is a good starting point for learning, okay? Then the, this is another question, how to get the best I can from a tissue that everyone has the best uh, possibilities to make the, the right lecture and then the right prediction. But in that case, just work on that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's so but even in terms of uh, scanning, do you have... most centers actually did not have even access to a nanozoomer. So in fact, there were centers, uh, we got the slides in Adelaide, so I got them scanned for another center, including ours, saying that, look, with the nanozoomer, you can, zoom up to like 400% without really losing quality. So a lot of centers did not have access. And then getting past the, them giving up their slides and sending them somewhere, and it's, 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 a, it's a next leap. Yeah, and I, and I think moving forward from this, um, yeah, I agree. It will be very difficult to get people, oh, can you dig out these slides? And, you know, I don't think it's doable for this project, but moving forward, this is definitely something we need to look at. I think for the purpose of this project, what we should probably do is a training session and then ask for rescoring. I think moving forward, this is probably what we need to do uh, when it comes to this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we can compare. We, we yeah. did this for enthesitis mm -hmm. in 2009. We published in arthritis and rheumatology before the reliability of baseline, the reliability after uh, the training session and the scanning. It was really great improvement. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Really that's, yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's yeah. If you want to have some information about the reliability, <laughs> just make it Agostino and then you will have <laughs> information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to roll out of being a pathologist. As a patient, I have not had, and I don't know what your experience with this is, Deb, or the way that you and Tiffany think about this, but I have not had a synovial biopsy, but I have had a whole heck of a lot of other stuff done. And the way that I think would be helpful in reaching multiple patient populations when you're talking about recruiting for something like this, never mind the money or the exact methodology or mm -hmm. anything like that, but something where it's intrinsically even low 
low invasiveness is still invasive, right? Because patients are not used to having biopsies taken. I think you need to come at it from both angles though, because mm -hmm. it's helpful for people to think through it. If it's like, oh, we want to predict what treatment is going to work. Some patients are like, well, I'm not that bad yet. So I don't really want to have you like mm -hmm. poking me and cutting me and injecting me with things. But if you also talk to them about, it saves you time. It saves you treatments that aren't going to do anything. And if you're actually worried about going, if you have someone who's like, oh, I really don't want to have to get an infusion all the time, you can tell them part of what we're trying to do is get to a point where we can tell you what we don't want to give you so yeah. that you don't have to take it. Yeah, definitely narrowing the focus. I just wanted to build on what you said. So after 2018, we have been communicating with Orly. So you put your pathology hat on, I'm putting my CEO of, a of an international um, patient foundation on since I'm not going to be silenced about it because you brought a lot to this. So in saying that, um, we have been doing some behind the scenes focus groups and asking patients specifically just that question, if you were to be asked. And so we all agreed that you know, our organization does what we call peer led education. So we are you, you are us. And what we do is we found that by educating them about precision medicine and the importance, having someone like Deb, who didn't have the opportunity and having them speak also, as this is what happens when you don't get matched, it's a huge issue with patients saying, ah, I'm not that bad, I'm going to hold off. So bringing in the patient organization in order to fill in that missing gap has it has been very important and it will be vital. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, we've we, we've done podcasts, we've done a lot of things. We've, yeah, yeah, we've done this. Exactly. The podcast was called Changing the Word with Your Knee, wasn't it? Yeah, so we, we've done that. And, and I think this, this, these things are really important as well. Um, and, and, and moving on from this, just to share my personal experience as, you know, I've, I've set up a whole biopsy program now in Glasgow and the way we recruit people. And I think, you know, some of that is kind of based on all the conversations we had. And this is to show how bilateral this is, you know, as a process um, is that so I recruit people that have swollen inflamed joints, but I'm, I'm not telling them, right, I'm going to biopsy you and send you home. I say, we're going to do that biopsy, but then I'm going to inject you with steroids. So in fact, you know, they get something out of it. Um, yes. And, and, but it's, and, and it's great because, you know, when you, when you phone them back a few weeks later, they actually are better, not because of the biopsy, obviously, because of the injection, but, you know, at, at least this is a way of, you know, giving back as well. When we, we were talking a few days ago, so you're already in the specific spot where you took the biopsy. You can inject the steroid in the same specific spot. So it's, it just, that just makes so much more sense. Yeah, because a lot of people are not necessarily, especially for knees, they're not necessarily getting um, ultrasound guided injections. And we know that then, you know, intra-articular injections are more likely to be efficient if they're delivered under ultrasound guidance. So that's another aspect. But um, right. So do we want to address the third question? And I'd like to know who hasn't signed in. So we have you on the list. Let's address the, the third question. Here, here, here. And you, I agree that uh, all tissues have uh, the same um, problem, the same challenges. Start with synovial tissue. Once you have validated this, <laughs> move to other tissues. It will be even easier. But if you go to lymph nodes now, if you go to muscle now, then you have to re-standardize the salivary gland we, will, we are doing. You have to always to think how to take the tissue. And it will be always the same. Once you have validated in one field, then it will be quite easy to apply the same standardization method to another field. I am not telling you, you will just have to take care of the tissue of the anatomy of the tissue, not of the standardization part. And I think this will make things much easier. When we started with synovitis, we took 10 years for standardizing, for learning how to standardize. When we moved to other diseases, the other scoring system in one year, two years was done. Yeah. 
Yeah, look, that, that sounds like a very valid and a fair point. Let's work on this first and standardize it and then uh, and the other groups can take learnings from this and so also we can from other groups yeah i i think that uh, yeah, it that, would be quite that, easy. that seems very reasonable i just uh, would like to follow what the patients uh, were telling i think that um, your contribution in that is so important so your uh, understanding of the disease and the challenges is something that is that it is very important especially in countries where the synovial biopsy is not part of the clinical process in italy it is all the patients with arthralgia goes to this. We make synovial tissue biopsy of everything, tenosynovium, things. So it is quite easy. And more you make, more it enters in the mind of the patients. And I think this is so great because we, this will permit us to go faster to the treatment, faster to the remission. You know, that's that's so good, but you're, you're, there's, it is definitely an exception because in Australia, I can say we are the only center. So now I've tried to establish two more centers and that's like the second center is like, just come on board. And now we're trying to establish two more, but it's really difficult. And one, one, one of the problems I've found is that uh, the ultrasound experts don't necessarily talk to the synovial experts and they don't necessarily have, there aren't those many people with knowledge of both. So they recognize it. So they recognize the importance of ultrasound and perhaps the biopsies, but because it doesn't, you know, the crossover isn't all that much. It's an exception rather than the rule. So you're very fortunate in very yeah, I, I, I believe that we are really fortunate, but we are really fortunate for the patients. Yes. And it is really very important because uh, research is always focused on patients. It's not just for, uh, for making it. It is just uh, really the, our target is uh, to improve a patient's of quality of life, whatever it is, the, uh, um, I would say the anchor that we use. And in countries like yours, for example, I think that uh, the help of patients will be very helpful. In uh, and also taking on board ultrasonographer, just make a meeting <laughs> and show them how could be how to to be trained. It will be really easy. Who is doing the synovial biopsy? Uh, are these the rheumatologists or the orthopedic surgeons? Or clinicians, ultrasonographers that take in biopsy, that they are very excellent. And we have these training uh, sessions and at ULAR it will be presenting a training uh, session uh, uh, possibility. So now we'll have, uh, we have a lot of fellows coming to us to learn, to teach in a really standardized way. They are able to take everything. Yeah, and to, to add on that, we we, we, we developed this uh, ultrasound biopsy program with ULAR as well, that is now at a two days course every year. And there is a, there is a full half day uh, hands-on with the biopsies. It's, um, we use cadavers. Um, so yeah, that's that's also, I think, something that will help the, the effort of standardizing as well. Yes. So we'll end on that note. Yeah, of course. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Great job, everyone. Thank you.